Very warm welcome to everybody at our 43rd monthly meeting of Soteria. Today we are going to hear Janine McBrady speaking on Juliet Nicholson. I think it's Juliet Nicholson's novel, The Big Sleep. And the title of her talk is Big Sleep, The Big Sleep and the Great Silence. So I look forward to that very much. Janine. Well, speaking as a left-handed person who uh, does everything with her right hand except right, uh, I, I found uh, your your remarks on handedness very interesting. Um, as a political scientist, I've always been interested in public policy, especially public policy that arises out of cataclysmic and um, uh, important events like like wars and disasters. And it's interesting to me how how much bad public policy comes out of bad circumstance that almost makes it seem like the circumstance was worse uh, than it needed to be. And we will go, uh, well, let me just give you an example, 9-11 in America, um, three, almost 3,000 people were killed, but nobody knew those people except their loved ones and their relatives and their friends. I, I don't think anything, anybody famous was killed on 9-11 and, and millions of people didn't know them. And out of that came, of course, um, the accusation that there were WMDs and we need the Patriot Act and all this, you know, stuff against terrorism that quite frankly has backfired in, in many, many ways. So from that point of view, the, the history contained in this book which is, is not a novel, it's, but it is a story. And um, I had a very difficult time deciding on, on what we should read today because I, I, it, I'm not into novels the way most people are. I do a lot of research. So this book, when I found it, um, I actually read the Portrait of a Marriage by Nigel Nicholson. Um, and I read it many, many years ago and always found it fascinating. And so when I when I saw who wrote this book, I thought, you know, I'm, I'm gonna see what it's about and what, what exactly is the great silence. Um, but the main reason that I chose it is because it speaks to me personally. And let me just, very quickly run it down. My parents were born, 1917 dad, 1920 mom, so that they had their childhood in the wake of World War One. They came of age in the Great Depression, yet another cataclysm, cataclysm that produced some very, very bad public policy. And then of course, World War II hit and what I noticed when I was reading this, uh, uh, The Great Silence, was how much the, the stories that she related of people, re I saw uh, a reflection of my parents in that, because I remember as a child, the first poetry my mother ever read to me was the the uh, in Flanders Field, you know, in Flanders Field where poppies blow amid the crosses row on row. And, and I still remember that. And she was telling me they had to memorize that as children, the way American children now have to learn the Gettysburg Address. And of course, they no longer have to do that. They're reading, I don't know, the Communist Manifesto. And perhaps they have to read and memorize parts of that. I'm not quite sure. But there's a certain amount of literary merit in the way that she conveys, at least when I read it, this is the way I felt about it, in the way she conveys what would otherwise be very, very straightforward scientific analysis, political analysis, um, uh, economic data of, of what was going on before, during, and after World War I. And so I thought it would be interesting for us to read it 
and then perhaps talk about um and 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 you you were talking about um freud and and psychological things and maybe think and and discuss a little bit about that part of what she's talking about the influence of this incredible event that for the most part and speaking as an American, I, I think I can verify this. Most Americans don't even consider World War I or don't even know that it even happened because we have lost the transmission of war knowledge from generation to generation to generation. So um, it, it, that's the reason that the, I chose this book. Um, and if you'd like to put it up, oops, I dropped my pen. Um, if you'd like to put up the text, I think we should probably start reading it because I, I and I don't know how long this will take, but I think you will you will understand as we go on why I chose it. So um, who wants to start? Did, Stedman, do you want to start? Oh, by the way, well, and just just let me say, some of this has been edited out of the chapter that it is taken from. Um, the important parts I left in, and hopefully the continuity uh, will will be retained. So. Um, Janine, I, I presume the um, introduction is, is is uh your is yours and the, the you, you'd like us to read from here from um ethel harrison's dress no, no that um oh this, this is from the introduction this, to the book yeah. okay yeah even the typed part is from the book okay um right. uh oh well i'll i'll read the introduction and um oh um uh, Michael in Amsterdam, would you would you care to pick up um, from uh, uh, well after the introductory paragraph is is, is finished? Uh, mm -hmm. if that's all right. So it's quite a challenge with that text. I hope we'll be um, right. and not the the uh, early part, but the, yes, it might be better a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Is that is yes, that that's much better? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Right. Um, the great silence. Introduction. During the summer of 1911, a record-breaking hot season three years before the outbreak of war, the strength of the sun had been sufficient to bleach out the pattern of purple pansies on newly married Ethel Harrison's dress. Already, social fragmentation had started to make itself felt. Is a, is a peacetime society or that on the surface seemed ordered and secure. Women, trade unionists, both houses of parliament, the servant class, the poor and the rich were all either seeking or resisting change. Some said that the 19th century did not begin until 1914, that the extended Edwardian idyll had lulled the English into a sense that not only was everything all right with the world, but that it always would be. Uh, Ethel Harrison's dress. Already social fragmentation had started to make itself felt in a peacetime society that on the surface seemed ordered and secure. Women, trade unionists, both houses of parliament, the servant class, the poor and the rich were all either seeking or resisting change. Some said that the 20th century did not begin until 1914. Isn't this what we just read? It, it yeah. is, although it's, it's correctly says there the 20th century. Yes. Yeah. 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 Said, it said oh, the 19th okay. century. That part should have been <laughs> should have been edited out. <laughs> My apologies. Right. So it, actually, it, you want to start in fact? Uh, <laughs> in fact, in fact, the structure of society had been shifting, sometimes in, perceptibly and sometimes as the reign of George V got underway in 1910 with some drama. The suffragette movement had become increasingly volatile and disturbing. The force feeding of imprisoned women whose crime had been to fight for votes for the unrepresented half of society had become more prevalent. Stones were thrown through windows of municipal buildings across the land. 
One suffragette tried to push the Home Secretary, Winston Churchill, beneath a moving train. And in June 1913, the campaign for the voice of women to be heard in the democratic process resulted in tragedy. During the Epson Derby, Derby Emily De Davidson, mm. at the age of 39, had thrown herself beneath the hammering hooves of Anmer, the king's horse. Her skull smashed her brains, so it was reported, spilling out onto the grassy track as Anmer did a complete somersault in full view of his owner. Just over six years later, women would be voting, and one of them, an American divorcee, would be representing a constituency in Parliament. The outbreak of war had brought with it a healing unity. Domestic problems were suppressed while the country joined together to fight side by side against a common enemy, experiencing a new sense of community across the classes with so many suffering, the loss of someone they loved. But with the end of the war, after the immediate relief experience when the fighting stopped, divisions returned with renewed intensity. In moments of honesty, many questioned whether the golden summers of the pre-war world had been as golden as memory willed them to be, or whether instead they had been the mere product of hindsight. Social discontent returned in louder voice and in louder voice. Now, too, a series of new divides had developed between the men who had gone to fight and the women who had been left behind to manage family life, between those too young to have absorbed the real lasting impact of what had happened and those who never got over it. The gulf between those who had experienced the closest thing to hell on earth and those who had only glimpsed it was to prove almost impossible to close. There were no bodies to bury during the Great War. A decision had been taken in 1915 that no corpses of whether officers or soldiers would be brought back from the front. There were simply too many for the authorities to be able to manage such a task. There was another reason, too. Many of the bodies were unidentifiable, being so badly mutilated, although that detail was not often made explicit. The dead remained abandoned drowned in the liquid mud into which they had slipped or been trampled, and were buried abroad either in the very place where they had lost their lives or in vast cemeteries, what Rudyard Kipling called a dead sea of arrested lives, set up by the Imperial War Graves Commission. Thanks, thanks Michael. Um, uh, Thomas, would, would, would you like to continue? Yes, of course, of course. Thank uh, you. Uh, <clears throat> Okay, so uh, from chapter nine, a year had elapsed since the guns had stopped firing, and at first glance, the country seemed drawn towards a determined gaiety. But the legacy of psychological wounds remained raw beneath the celebratory optimism. By the time of the first anniversary of the armistice arrived, many, particularly those in senior positions in government, and most particularly the King of England, had hoped that the memories of the war would have begun to recede. But the intervening years had proved that the effects of war on the British people were not to be erased in so short of time. Indeed, the first year of peace carried with it more national tum tumult uh, than had been seen in several decades before the war. with pretty notes. As the date of the armistice anniversary grew closer, there was still no plan or announcement of any ceremony marking the event. The, the event, event, I suppose. Okay, the event, okay. Yep. Two people, Mr. Donald Howard, who wanted the parade and the noisy display of celebration, and Mr. Edward Honey, who wanted church services to provide five minutes of silence, offered suggestions. And these were forwarded to the Prime Minister, Lloyd George. Sir Percy told the Prime Minister that three minutes of silence were observed every day in the South African War. The Prime Minister was intrigued. Uh, I think PM is Prime Minister? Yes. No? Uh, okay, but the King was cautious, fearing that his subjects might question his right to rule. The PM wore him down. However, 
and an announcement from the king was made from Buckingham Palace that following the sounding of the bell on the 11th of November of 1911, uh, yeah, I eight, think. 11 a.m. Yeah. Okay, 11 a.m. Uh, two minutes of silence would be observed with complete suspension of all our normal activities. Yeah, here it gets a little bit a little uh, bit confusing because again the 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 editing was difficult from okay. Do, do you want mind, me to start with temperatures? Uh, yeah, yeah. Temperatures had dropped during the night to a low, uh, to a level lower than any could remember over fifty years. A dancing sparkle of frost covered the English countryside. Four-year-old Geoffrey Woolley was in the garden with his governess, where the gardener was going about the winter business of repairing and sluicing uh, down yes. the tall rock beds. Uh, the first chimes of the drawing room clock that marked the hour began to ring out from inside the house, and the governess suddenly burst into a run, racing towards the gardener, shouting that he must turn off the hose at once. The noise of the water threatened to destroy the imminent, the imminent silence. The day of the silence fell in the middle of school term, and there was an unusual calm in the parish household. Three-year-old Pam's brother and sisters had gone to school. Apart from the cook preparing lunch in the two pet badgers waiting patiently by the front door in the hall to be taken for their morning walk in the fields around Sidcup, all was mm. quiet. Pam and her mother were alone in the house. Just as the gardener clock, uh, grandfather clock uh, began to strike, Pam's mother, her long, thick chestnut hair flying behind her, rushed into the playroom and, gripping Pam by the hand, motioned to her not to speak, not to make a sound. Copying her mother, Pam knelt beside her on the kitchen floor. Together, they joined their hands together fingertips touching in a gesture of prayer. Pam thought, still only three, uh, Pam, though still only three, knew she was being asked to remember something terrible and to give thanks that it would never happen again. Her mother had told her that they were remembering the great war to end all wars and that Pam should be thankful that in her lifetime there would never again be anything like it. In Whiteley's department store near near Paddington. The doors closed at 10.54 a.m. And shoppers and assisters, assistants together assembled beneath the vaulted room at 10 minutes to the hour. The Reverend Mr. Murphy, vicar of St. Matthew's Bayswater, invited them to sing, O oh God, our help in ages past. His Irish boom rising to the balconies, four floors above before the hymn came to an end, just before 11 o'clock, as shoppers prepare themselves for silence. In Selfridges, a solitary bugler walked out onto the central balcony of the store overlooking Oxford Street and sounded his instrument to signal the approaching silence. At Harrods, in Knightsbridge, the fire alarms were rung. In the city at Lloyd's Insurance Brokers, the huge 106-pound lutein bell rang out, as it always did, when the need arose to mark an event of, nat of national importance. A murder trial at the Old Bailey was interrupted. In Baltimore, Maryland, the train on which, on which the Prince of Wales was traveling was halted, and in England, the entire railway network of passengers, trains, good trains, and shutting in Shunting engines juddered and clanked to a standstill. Trading on the stock market ceased. Out in the channel, ships stayed their course. Just before 11 o'clock there was a tremendous burst of synchronized noise across the country. In the cities of London, Birmingham and Bradford, maroons were fired into the sky and burst with a great clatter. Cities that even in the small hours of the night were never silent. Were never silent, were about to experience something unprecedented. Town clocks struck with mechanical predictability, and in village churches up and down the land, peals of bells, so often used for celebration, 
with their repeated tumbling refrain, summoned people to stand still and to remember. In the coastal towns of Britain, the signal for those in distress at sea, which customarily caused families of sailors to flinch and pause with fear, rang out. At Piccadilly Circus, the place where Londoners felt the pulse of their city, the traffic was still flooding when the first maroon sounded. By the time the second maroon was heard, the heartbeat was arrested. The man late for work no longer ran for the bus. Families huddled at the edge of the pavement, poised to dash across the street. A window cleaner steadied his leather. The violet cellar fell silent. Over them all, the elegant stone wings of Eros were as, as ever frozen in motion. For a moment or two, as the traffic came to a halt, a faint underhung could be heard. Then all conversation ceased. The only sound was the splash of the fountain. No, thanks very much. Uh, Hewitt, would, would you care to continue? Yes, yes. Thank you. Now, underneath the um, London streets, all underground trains had ceased to run. Above ground, London was normally so frantic that the police were often in despair. Motorcycles carried with them a particular danger, according to the mid-November issue of the Saturday Review, and seemed to drive at full speed at pedestrians, while the police were seen to scold instead of soothing the pedestrians who appeal for help. But just before 11 a.m., motorcycles and cars waited obediently at junctions. Engines stilled as war office lorries, taxis, and motor buses came to a halt. Horses exhaled deeply as they were pulled up by the side of the road. Bicycles braked. Road menders laid down their spades. Telephone exchange operators unplugged their connection boards. Factory workers switched off the machinery. Dock workers stopped their unloading. School children stopped their lessons. Miners downed their tools. Shoppers stopped their purchasing. Lovers stopped murmuring. And even villagers talking to one another over the garden fence held their tongues. In London, the king and queen had sent their wreath to Whitehall in advance of their own arrival, and just before Big Ben's minute hand moved to the top of the clock, Lloyd George, white moustache, moustachioed, his long hair touching the collar of his dark tailcoat, was seen walking towards the now rather dilapidated wood and plaster cenotaph that had continued to be a focus the mourners since the summer. He was carrying orchids and white roses mm -hmm. woven into a circlet of laurel leaves, an announcement that the monument would be demolished earlier in the year, early in the year had prompted a huge protest against the Ministry of Works for being utterly without soul or sentiment or understanding. But while Whitehall and Lutyen's monument provided the grand backdrop for royalty and statesmen and other leaders of the nation, this was really a silence designed for the common man. Men bared their heads, holding their hats before them in clasped hands. Only the act of breathing, the final affirmation of life, remained as a sign of human activity. In that fraction of a second before the silence began, a reporter for the Times noticed a certain hesitancy in the step in anticipation of the moment. And within those small gestures, 
an unmistakable determination not to miss it. Uh, so thanks. Uh, AJ, would, would you be able to take over? Okay. Thanks. Uh, can I mention I have no idea what's happening? Oh, really? Oh, well, <laughs> maybe that, that will increase I'm the... I'm not British. Maybe there's something in your history that I don't know about, but I'll read it, but I, I need to... Yeah, all, all will be re revealed at the end then. <laughs> okay. <laughs> all right. The first stroke of Big Ben announcing the hour of 11 gave notice of what was required as the nation fell still. Here and there, an old soldier could be detected slipping unconsciously into the posture of attention, wrote an observer, the hush deepened. At precisely 11 a.m., all movement stopped. In that silence, many prayed that the meaning of death would somehow be revealed, but some questioned whether such understanding would give them relief from unhappiness. No one who had lost someone in the war, and it was estimated that three million people had lost someone close, was immune from grief. Many tried not to give in to it, believing that acknowledgement of the intensity of their feelings would lead them to the verge of collapse. Some found that after the initial shock, a state of denial was in itself a comfort. Others were like Andrew Bonar Law, the conservative chancellor and the leader of the house during the wartime coalition government. Bonar Law had lost two of his sons killed in action and his friend, Lord Blake, described how Bonar Law was managing her, his loss. Night seems to have descended upon him for the moment he was incapable of work and could only sit despondently gazing into vacancy. All those dark clouds, which were never far below the horizon of his thought, came rolling up obliterating light and happiness. Silence was unlikely to bring much comfort to Bonar Law. For within silence lies not only stillness, but also agitation, the agitation of memory. For the agitated mind, silence can become a place of threat and even of terror. At a time when the pain rather than the comfort of memory predominates, the great winds of silence continue to be. Absolute silence remains elusive. That morning, the Times reporter described how even in the high Alps, the solemn stillness which sometimes comes with the night is broken by the groan of the creeping glacier or smothered thunder of a distant avalanche. In the depth of a wood at twilight, a leaf rustles or a twig snaps. In London's Westminster, the sudden sharp sound of a woman's sob was made all the more painful by its unexpected. Its isolation and its quivering echo coming and going, strengthening and fading, fading between the tall gray buildings of Whitehall. Life, breath, sound would go on, but never again without being mistrusted or feared. Certainty and dependability had gone. This was, in Quaker terms, a living silence. Those who took part were actively engaged in thought. There were some in the crowd or on the cenotaph who had come with their families to take part in the solemn moment for whom the outside world no longer held any meaning. The damaging roar of the trenches had made many unable to hear even the slightest sound. For them, silence was a permanent state. But during the lulls in the firing in France, one enfeebled sound had persisted through all, usually as clear as with the first light of day. The unexpected and welcome sound of bird song was suffered notice by Duff Cooper, who had written from the trenches to his girlfriend Diana Manners in 1918, to tell her how still bravely the lark continued to sing. Everywhere else in mm. France, they are shot by the Francais Sportive, he wrote. But here, since neither the English nor the Germans can ever hit anything, they are perfectly safe with the result that the front line had become a regular bird refuge, and one has any wit, has anyhow always to be awake at dawn, which, as you know, is their favorite hour for kicking up a row. Maybe some of those who stood now, with their heads bowed, their heads bared, were summoning from memory the beauty of the bird song, perhaps the only thing of beauty that had encountered, they had encountered during four years. The quality of this silence was strained, brigaming over with pain. 
tear stream from the eyes of men and women. As the two minutes ended, there was a reluctance and uneasiness in resuming movement. This ending was not like the movement at the end of an examination in school when the chair scraped back with audible relief or of a church service when the organ bursts into life and the congregation collects its belonging and re-engages with the daily business of living. The moment that immediately followed the silence seems to extend itself fractionally. Before, as if in slow motion, hats were replaced, throats were cleared, and the traffic once again began to move. This curious suspension of sound and movement had shown, as the Times commented, a glimpse into the soul of the nation. Thanks very much. Uh, Janine, would you, would you like to uh, continue? The day after the silence, the motionless tableau of a shattered country was unfrozen, at least on the surface. Many, including the Prime Minister Lloyd George, hoped that the great silence would prove to have been a moment of national catharsis, the result similar to a massive, instantaneously effective blood transfusion. But the following morning, only a day after the country had engaged in its collective act of remembrance, the Times carried an unsigned advertisement in the personal columns. Lady of gentle birth, clergyman's widow, insane through overwork, poverty, air raids, loss of a husband, brothers killed in war, has two children. Inquiries welcome. Nomination to suitable home or financial aid wanted to give her reasonable chance of recovery. Will anyone help? Silence had not proved to be a cure for her. For others less traumatized, the tattler of that week carried a notice for clincher motor tires showing a woman draped in furs and a man in evening dress sitting in a beautiful car. When the old moon smiles at these nights, you can't help smiling back, ran the caption, going on to encourage the reader, contemplating moonlight expeditions. Moonlight no longer betokens the possible visit of Gothas and Zepps. That evening, Lady Diana Cooper was still unable to stand without support as she appeared at the Albert Hall wearing, 18th century, wearing an 18th century Russian costume for another victory ball. She was not enjoying the ball at all, immobile in her, by now, hated bath chair, and confiding her misery to a very drunk but increasingly sympathetic Lord Beaverbrook in his private box, while her husband of five months had excused himself from the party and vanished. She was sure he was seeking out that annoying Diana Cappell, the woman whose husband was rumored to be having an affair with the clothes designer Coco Chanel, leaving his wife free to spend time with her husband. Duff had arrived at the ball wearing a false beard. His wife was annoyed to notice that earlier he had removed it during the course of the dancing and was looking more handsome than ever. Outside, the snow began to fall across the country from Edinburgh to Dartmoor. But inside the Albert Hall, the party goers celebrating the first anniversary of the armistice appeared as gay and lighthearted as ever. Paper streamers decorated the walls and balloons floated high up into the huge ceiling vault. All thoughts of another formal pageant or procession were abandoned because, as the sketch pointed out, quite frankly, people wanted to dance. Reserve was thrown aside. The outfits were mesmerizing. Gentlemen in satin knickerbockers, ladies in pom-pom frocks, and thigh-skimming dresses whirled around the huge dance floor. A Mrs. Ashley was spotted by reporters for the society pages holding a giant powder box fashioned as an umbrella, her skirt an elegant powder puff. Mademoiselle Edme Dormiel came as a bunch of large hothouse grapes, a full vine on her charming head. The time for national mourning was, Lord George continued to hope, now at an end, and yet he sensed his optimism to be manufactured. At dinner with Duff Cooper a year earlier, he had voiced those fears. He spoke to Duff of the long memories of the British 
He spoke of those still alive who remembered the great famine of 70 years earlier and that one should never rouse those memories because it was a dreadful thing to fight against the ghosts. In 1919, there were ghosts in every town and village in the country. The ghosts of those, <coughs> excuse me, who had fought for their country and who had been denied the burial and homecoming that their relations knew was their due. The silence had aroused old feelings, just as receding memories had begun to settle. Some wished for a more permanent silence. Others chose to carry on dancing. Thank you very much. And I think, yeah, okay, I think that's the end. Yeah. Um, oh, thank, thank, thanks for it very, very, very much. Um, AJ, did, did, did it become clear what the Great Silence was? There was a, a kind of nationally mandated moment of silence to mourn their war dead for World War One. Is that yes, indeed. Uh, that that continues yeah. to to this day on. Uh, Remember the Day. yes, the, the nearest Sunday to to the eleventh of November. Um, in, in America, is there not something similar? I'd always foolishly thought it was it would have been common maybe to to, to between us. This is this is why I found this book very so very interesting. And in the first part, uh, where they talk about the the social problems that that were going on before the war. For instance, I didn't know there were two Balkan wars before World War One. I. I I had no idea that before this this great cat cataclysm, there were always these minor skirmishes over nationalism for independence and and that sort of thing so that the war horrible as it was for for europeans was not the same as for the 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 continental people especially towards the east and what it does i think is shows the split as i saw in my own family between the female romanticization of the war, and not all because there were nurses and women involved obviously in the war, who had the luxury of, for the first time in their lives, experiencing freedom. So when you juxtaposition that with the PTSD that we now know the men were suffering, but they, they did not have a term for it, but shell shock, I think, was World War II. Mm -hmm. World War I, I'm not quite sure what they called it, but there was this division. And of course, by the time the war ended, the younger people simply wanted to forget it. And I think the, the, um, the way, and I'm not fond of uh, female authors, by the way, the way that she presents the great silence with such detail, um, we don't have anything like that in America, except for the lockdown over COVID. <laughs> I don't think there's ever been a time when America has simply stopped and thought about what's going on. Now, in terms of war remembrance of World War I, I don't know if there was any um, local, you know, town or small city remembrance. I'm sure there were parades. Um, and certainly we owe a debt of gratitude to the composer who wrote over there, uh, Mr. Cohen, or Cohen, depending on how you want to pronounce it. Um, but there has been a neglect of the recognition of World War I in America. And so for my research, for my book, <laughs> um, I found this to be incredibly prescient in terms of what has happened after every war since World War I. In my family, my mother romanticized the war. And of course, as I said, 
if you look at the dates when people are born, which is very important to me as a writer, if you look at dates when people were born, you have to ask, what did they live through as children? Well, we know what the Americans lived through. World War One, then the Great Depression, then World War Two, and for my father, Korea. Mm -hmm. And what happens to me growing up in the wake of World War II, Vietnam, and then what, Gulf One, Gulf Two, I mean, this constant war. And so for, for people who are not American, and I don't know, AJ, if, if, if you think about this or, or um, incorporate this in your American experience, this idea of the eternal wars we seem to be having, in, in America on a large scale, um, unlike our European uh, cousins. But a, a, anyway, uh, I'm wondering I, I, what you, you guys thought about it in terms of the literary quality hmm. of the writing. Yeah, I, I think it was good to uh, her evocation of the meaning of the silence that may not have been an experience formally uh, and nationally that, that people would, would have experienced and um, to you know, bring associations to that from the the front and uh, the, the, the singing of birds, uh, uh, grub, grub breaking the silence, uh, and no man's land, things like that, I think, uh, uh, yeah, it was, was, was very good but with the details that, that did impinge on my memories of Remembrance Day, because uh, it, it's something that everyone in Britain still experiences uh, in, in November, the uh, silence. Uh, but so, I mean, you, you, you don't have a national moment of silence in America I, I, uh, at all. That's not a... Oh, right. Uh, Michael, in Germany, is, is, is something very similar? Uh, well, it's, strangely, I don't know the origins. Um, it's quite the reverse. On in November the 11th, so it's the official carnival opening in, in cities right. that have carnival, which is uh, must be a, a, a connection. But it, I don't think it's deliberately malicious, but mm -hmm. it's a fascinating fact. It is the 11th minute mm -hmm. um, uh, past 11 o'clock on the 11th of November that carnival officially begins in Cologne. Um, as for remembering anything of of, of the war, um, there is, I think, supposed to be or uh, two minutes of silence for the dead in Dresden, um, which is right. always interrupted by the gentlemen of the anti-fascist brigade, um, so that it's not a moment of silence. But I think that is, the, as far as I know, the only sort of official memory. Yeah, that is upheld because, of course, in Germany would rather forget that there was a Second World War, apart from as a sort of lesson as how terrible Hitler was. That they really don't even want to talk about it. And the same, certainly the First World War, I think, has dis disappeared into some kind of a memory hole for most Germans. Mm -hmm. It will be interesting to know how different participants, different participant countries do remember the, mm. the the Great War and the Second World War really. I mean, the, the the good thing about silence is it's free of any interpretation, isn't it? So each of us can yes can yes. bring what we think of the event to to it. It's it's certainly something that that could be remembered as uh, yeah yeah. I think that, that, but I, I think the memories of these war are, are, are torn with terrible underlying contradictions, even if people don't want to acknowledge them, because the one contradiction mm -hmm. is for everybody the terrible things that happened and the loss and then the question was it worth it and was it mm. in a good cause or not mm. and mm. this mm. underlies i think in every country uh, mm. certainly germany it, it obviously so strongly that nothing's celebrated but mm. even mm. in other countries as well there's the seeing as was that justified was that right particularly with the first world war yeah that yeah. world war is easier in a way because most people don't like Hitler, mm, therefore, yeah. it's easy. But first of all, it was very problematic with a lot of writing now that puts mm. more and more blame on, on Russia and France instead of Germany, and therefore um, mm. that it was not justified making Germany solely responsible for the First World War. So there is a lot of sort of underlying problems going on, I think, with the celebration but, but the, of the, 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 the wearing of the poppy. The silence is big enough to 
encompass all of those interpretations, isn't it? Because it's it it's, be, um, it, it's mm. entirely neutral. Uh, yes. is, I think yes. why it's it, rather it, it's, than it's a, a parade. Yes, yes. Yeah, yes. I mean, it, it, I I know that so I occasionally went to uh, remembrance events when there was a, a Christian priest. I don't know, giving it. I don't know, an, an embarrassingly. Yeah, I, I, I sort of try it justification of mm -hmm. first world war and everything. It was just, yeah, I don't know. Uh, yeah, once you get into that, you get into very difficult ground. Yeah, you know, you know right? but yeah, but bringing in Jesus and everything. I don't know. It was also mm -hmm. yeah, but um, uh, yeah, um, oh, yeah, um, Thomas, what what happens in Portugal? Did yeah. you have a, a yeah. national remembrance in Portugal? So uh, we. Uh, historically, uh, Portugal participated in the First World War, not in the Second. Um, it remained neutral all, uh, during the Second World War. Um, and um, there's there's not really uh, one of those remembrance moments in the sense that uh, like a, a big uh, silence as described mm. here. Mm. Um, I think for many reasons, uh, well, because it, it, it wasn't a major uh, war effort in the same sense that it was in other countries. So we mm -hmm. had uh, several battalions that uh, went to Lali and uh, most of them, most of those men died uh, uh, and uh, they are remembered in, you know, street names and whatnot. Uh, every city has... Uh, uh, an mm -hmm. avenue called the Avenida dos Combatentes da Grande Guerra, meaning the avenue of the combatants of the Great War um, and, and things like that. But I think it's also important to, to note that Portugal entered the war uh, essentially to uh, make itself, um, in the eyes of the British, uh, valiant and brave, uh, which is very silly because they were very angry at the British at the time uh, because of the pink map debacle the colonies and and such mm -hmm. and um it was seen uh by the intelligentsia at the time after the the war as um a very idiotic war that didn't make any sense that uh, didn't prove any national um uh, pride that uh, it didn't really accomplished anything so it it, it uh, more or less came to uh, that realization of uh, a wasted uh, generation a wasted youth that was also more or less felt uh, in uh, some other places in in europe uh, mm. i would also like to add that uh, that being said that there, there is something uh, extremely beautiful about that silence and about that description of that silence and um it, it reminded me uh, in a way of um uh, this uh, german sorry for the, the trains uh sorry <laughs> um it, it reminded me of a german jewish author which i don't really uh appreciate that much but i think he has a very powerful image uh, Walter Benjamin uh, uh, yeah. about the, the angel of history uh, and the, the silence would be a sort of a suspension complete suspension of, of time and the, the, the revelation of something that's very deep and that history really doesn't have a progress and that uh, the angel of history looks at the catastrophe why died um, contemplating all the death and destruction and whatnot in the image of Paul Klee's uh, famous image of the of the of that angel, and uh, it really reminded me of that of uh, the the only moment of of uh, if you will of um, um, beauty is when history itself is suspended in a way, and that the locomotive, the terrible locomotive of history can just stop for uh mm. i don't know how many minutes two or three mm. and um and you can more or less think about the situation you can more or less understand something about the situation mm. um and yeah. 
that's that's what I <laughs> wanted to say about that. Though. Yeah, that's that's a good point. Um, Hewitt, uh, you 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 are keen to contribute. I I want to pick up um, an element in what Thomas has just said. Um, but also to relate to I think another of the themes that Janine is focusing on. Uh, which is that the old European world, in effect, came to an end with the First World War, the Great War. Um, and it, it, it's a bit crazy because my father was born in 1880, and I was born in 1945 when Adolf Hitler was still alive, and just... Mm. And um, my father actually saw service in the First World War, but not on the Western Front. He was in what was then called Mesopotamia, which I think is now part of Iraq. And uh, he saw very little action. Uh, it was a kind of sentry duty task. And um, uh, during 1916, he played pontoon, vingt-et-un, the card game, regularly, and he won £60 in six months. And £60 was a lot of money. Well, yeah, yes, indeed. Yeah. indeed. So he wow. it was probably about something like £1,000 sterling. Now, yes. Or, or sort of uh, $1,500 or um, 1,200 euro. Um, so it was a lot of money, and um, to the best of my awareness, he was not psychologically scarred by the First World War. My mother, who was born in 1900, was profoundly scarred by both wars, and I have an internalized sense of history, which comes from my connection with both of them, but the as it were, the feeling dimension of it came primarily from my mother. Mm -hmm. But as I've grown older and entered adulthood, I came to understand that whilst the 20s and parts of the 30s were a period of gigantic effort in literature and philosophy, and the exploration of history, and so on. Nearly all of that literature was about bereavement. It was about loss. It was about the ending of a world. Now, Wittgenstein's Tractatus, Heidegger's Being in Time, the uh, Phenomenology of Husserl, uh, Proust's à la recherche du temps perdu, uh, the massive writings about Christianity and the end of institutional Christianity, which was anticipated by Kierkegaard uh, in the writings of people like Bultmann, Paul Tillich, and um, uh, Karl Barth. Um, and I, I, could, I could go on, T.S. Eliot, mm. Virginia Woolf, D.H. Lawrence, uh, and so on. Right. And um, obviously in Germany, Thomas Mann um, and um, many others. That is to me what, the, even more than the horrendous, the catastrophe, the, the devastating, the things that anyone who's not been in a war has no comprehension of, and yeah. I'm those, but at least I have some imagination for it. Mm. But I believe that it, not in Fukuyama's sense, but in the reverse, World War I, in many ways, was the end of our history. It was the end of our historical consciousness 
It's taken a long time for that to unfold, but the loss of stable belief system of any kind has meant that our collective memory has had nothing to hold on to. And that is what is happening now. And um, uh, I'm I married to an American, and I believe that America is an extraordinary, um, the United States is an extraordinary world, but it has also pioneered the loss of history in many ways. Mm -hmm. And the fact that the, uh, the majority of Americans have no comprehension whatsoever of what the Great War was about is an index of that. We still have a little in Britain, but thanks to Margaret Thatcher and Tony Blair, mm -hmm. the historical sense has been more or less abolished in our schools. There's a paradox there in that there are hidden aspects of history which are stronger than ever, but the consciousness of history is dying for the present time. My, my, Michael, in Amsterdam, what, do, do, do you have any thoughts about the general uh, subject or, or the piece well, of writing I, in specific? I mean, I really enjoyed uh, Nicholson's description of the <clears throat> of the Great Silence. That, that mm. was quite moving. And and the I mean it was labeled the Great War because it was the, the war that was supposed to have ended all wars. What follows immediately is the is the great influenza of uh, nineteen eighty. Yes, indeed, indeed, yeah, yeah. And that was something in America I I never heard of until just shortly before my father died. Mm -hmm. He mentioned that uh his mother had got the, got the influenza, and I think his brother did. They both survived, but he talked about the babysitter down the street who, and it was a German community, uh, but she passed with the influenza, and he remembers seeing her body placed in the window so everyone could see it. But on the other hand, <clears throat> I remember Gloria Swanson once talking about the Roaring Twenties, which then followed all this. And she was explaining that that period of time, people were thought war was finished, that the Great War had was the mm, war, mm, war mm, over. Mm. And so there was an incredible joyous optimism that, that it, you know, lasted up until the Great Depression. Mm, mm. Um, I, I, remember, I was in Manhattan staying with my grandparents when the, the Second World War ended. And I mean, I just remember everyone through every newspaper they had out out their windows, and so I was walking through little tunnels of with newspapers mm -hmm. piled over my head uh, mm -hmm. on either side. And I asked my parents afterwards when I, when I realized that the war was over, and I remember saying, you know, does that mean we don't have to have any more news? Because the news <laughs> is always so depressing. Uh, <laughs> And and my mother said no. She said we'll, we'll always have news. <laughs> What's the point of the war being over if if we're going to still have all that? And but on the uh, the uh, silence and again just with the birds at dawn, uh, I do remember during the lockdown in London, being able to walk down the middle of King's Road. And hearing birds singing, which I had, I had never had that experience before. So mm. that was an incredible kind of, um, that, that was thrilling, that part. Yeah. yeah. Uh, on the consciousness of history, <clears throat> I, I mean, it does seem to me that people just have, I, we had dinner the other day with a 24 year old. And he, I mean, he's fascinated because of hearing what we have to say, but it's not something that is really part of, of his world. Um, they're into uh, a kind of a technology which I can't comprehend, and they communicate with one another through all this internet stuff, and it's a, uh, it's a kind of world of being which is almost so alien he did admit that they don't have time to go out into nature they don't have time to uh, really experience 
uh, the quiet of a woods or something like that. They, and if even if they do go out to the woods, they will still have their uh, their phone with them. So it's I don't know where this is going to to lead. A lot of my friends say that this is all it's a phase, and this phase will this woke culture mm -hmm. and this, this kind of thing and this almost mindlessness will will end. But if you look at the world situation now, it doesn't seem like we have advanced at all. When you consider what's happening in Gaza, what's happening in Ukraine, what's happening in the Sudan, uh, and who knows how many hundreds of other places. So I, I do still describe myself as a militant optimist, but it becomes quite uh, a challenge at times. Yeah. Oh, thanks. Uh, Thomas, I think you, you got your hand. Okay, well, thank you, thank you. I, I just, uh, Michael was saying something I think is very, very interesting about um, how how the, the 20s were this strange uh, party in a way, uh, because, you know, this was so incredibly violent, and then you had this uh, other sort of moment that was very uplifting in a way but uh, honestly uh, it, it's it, it seems to me obviously i've not lived through it but it seems to me when you read the, the literature at the time and you see the aesthetic movements at the time that uh, this uh, roaring Oh, sure. <laughs> These roaring uh, 20s were hiding a sort of uh, a, a deeper sort of um, very, very deep sadness. And uh, you can also see it on, on the, I, I read very recently uh, this uh, Louis Ferdinand Céline's uh, mm -hmm. uh, novel about the war that was, you know, being hidden away in uh somewhere and um and it, it's it's it, it makes sense that um all, all of um the throwing away of of morality the throwing away of uh you know uh, bourgeois norms uh it, it's not a, a sort of a, a will to live it, it's um it's a will to die as well it's um it's uh, it's not really a party as much as it is a sort of a funeral, uh, <laughs> in my opinion, maybe. Yeah, yeah. Um, I um I I do. Do, do, do you have any any thought? Do you? No, not really. <laughs> Again, I, I, uh, this whole conversation. You have to understand my background, even though I've been living in the States since 1959, all this World War I, World War II just passed my family by in Cuba. We sunk a couple of German subs off the coast of Florida. Other than that, we mostly sat it out. So this stuff doesn't really, I don't have a, a kind of lived experience of going through all this remembrance and this kind of stuff. You know, mm -hmm. so not have that. Well, AJ, I... what do you think of, of the idea of the proper way to show respect for the dead. It, it, it's in, in other words, like some cultures, um, and I'm thinking of like New Orleans, right? And you see funerals and they've got and they've got the parasols and the bands mm. and the saints go marching in and there's there's almost this kind of uh, uh, rejoicing in terms of of you know leaving this veil of tears. whereas mm. whereas, other cultures are are, are quiet, mm. but but not not quiet in the same way as the great silence. And that's why I entitled it "The Big Sleep and the Great Silence," because it's almost as though we are we are sleeping in terms of remembering what what death really is. And that we don't we don't really do anything about it, but but things like war and and floods, tornadoes, whatever, which you know, 
force us to confront mega death, mm -hmm. which is quite different than individual family members passing on. And I'm wondering, uh, in 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 Cuba, what what does your culture say about silence as a phenomenon in and of itself? I think it's quite similar. I think it's considered appropriate. We just didn't get involved in a lot of these wars, but it isn't that we would not feel the same thing, you know? Um, there is one thing that I can contribute, not so much from the civilian side, but having studied um, how past cultures have dealt with it, that I know the United States at least has not done a good job. Um, there are many cultures and even our own culture in the distant past, as far as the Hebrew Bible and stuff, warriors returning home from whatever conflict were put through a purification ritual on the way in because everybody comes back with some kinds of baggage because, you know, our, our brains are not really suited, you know, to this kind of mass uh, catastrophe. Mm -hmm. Right. And uh, it is it has been said by some anthropologists that the purification ritual helped them reintegrate mm -hmm. back into yeah. society. And what I've seen in the United States, I'm not being critical, but what I've seen is nobody wants to deal with it. There's a kind of denial, like nothing happened. Everybody's just supposed to come home and pick up where you left off. Mm -hmm. In none of these conflicts are people able to just come home and pick up. Mm -hmm. left mm -hmm. Like, um, I'm I'm a fan of uh, film noir. Uh, it was kind of 1940s uh, fiction and po immediate post-war. And in those movies, it really shows how people were dislocated. That was supposed to be the greatest generation and rah-rah and fighting Nazis were good and all this kind of stuff. But that's not the way people felt. You know, it wasn't just one ticker tape parade. A lot of people, even mm. though they were, they perceived themselves as fighting the good fight, they were dislocated. They didn't know what to do with themselves. You know, a lot of people, and mm. this is not something unique to any one country mm. or culture. I think what differs is the way people deal with it. Mm. I, the, I, sorry. I think there's an avoidance. There's, a, there, there's just mm. avoidance of the negative. I, I just want to um, uh, add something to AJ's um, uh, thought there because I think it's it, it's quite relevant. I was talking to a friend of mine whose father had been in a Japanese prisoner of war camp for several years, and uh, he was one of the lucky people who survived. And uh, he had written an account of this afterwards, and my friend had uh, read it. And uh, the thing that surprised me was that. Um, when they were finally liberated and on the way back home on the ship, when one would have expected them to have been jubilant and looking forward to uh, returning to families and normal life, a lot of the people felt very, very depressed. And he was saying that several people committed suicide because they felt they wouldn't be able to fit in again, which is really, really surprising. And it, it does reinforce your point that it, it yeah even though people have done nothing wrong and they should come back feeling happy there's some yeah there, there, there's something that has to be dealt with and maybe yeah some formal process could perhaps help to that from an anthropological point of view um i i think it was i think Heward, uh and then and then uh, michael just following up that um in the uh, Vietnam War, people that came home were helicoptered out, flown home, and joined communities that had not the slightest idea of what they had been through. And a lot of them ended up in the trees in Montana and North Dakota and so on and so forth as a result, and completely dropped out with uh, post-traumatic stress problems. The Philippines campaign in the Second War, the Second World War, 
was one of the most ferocious campaigns ever fought, one of the most horrific uh, between the Americans and the Japanese. But the soldiers came home in troop carriers where there would be 6,000 soldiers at sea for several weeks. And the result of that was that there was a sort of ad hoc therapeutic community would form. People would fall apart. People would quarrel with one another. People would put arms around each other and comfort each other. And a lot of feeling was able to be expressed and got free cathartic. And consequently, those people didn't have such a problem of alienation as the people coming home from the Vietnam War because they had that kind of mm. ad hoc rite of passage that they literally a rite of passage um, mm. that was involved in coming home in the truth troop carrier. Mm. And um, uh, that obviously in a sense was accidental, but the result of it was more creative and enabled more people to come to terms with what they had been through. Oh, uh, Michael? Uh, yeah, I was, I, you know, I went to a, a, a rally, anti-war rally in Rhode Island in America. Um, I can't even remember which war we were protesting. <laughs> <in>. <laughs> uh, I think it was Iraq, but it, anyhow, yeah. one of the speakers mentioned that the suicide rate among uh, Vietnam veterans was three times higher than the casualties in the war itself. Uh, and I had really, never, really so and I had never put it together, but I suddenly realized, well, that's my brother. My brother was a veteran. He finally took his own life. Yeah, 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 and. That's all, I mean, the the idea of coming home afterwards, it's not just that they can all put their arms around each other on the ship. Mm -hmm. They have to live with that. And and many, a, a huge number cannot. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> how we collectively, I don't know what we do to help people like that, how we commemorate something, how we uh, then try to deal with the pain that has been that's that is a legacy. Um, I don't know what we're learning and what mm -hmm. we're actually able to do. Um, I I think something has to change, but I have no idea how to go mm -hmm. about having that happen. Maybe some sort of buffer zone, uh, as uh, uh, Hugh had spoke about in relation to the the the, the ship void, something like that, that the transition. I know, I know this this is not perhaps a good an, uh, analogy, but I know people that are, are, are doing, who've done a very large number of consecutive marathons. Um, uh, they're, they're, I had interviewed a chap who, who, who'd been doing a marathon, going to do a marathon for one, every, every day of the year. And the, the, the plan was that, that he, he should not stop at the end. He should just very, very slowly taper down the... Um, the, the mileage because coming off of that it could could be yeah it can have all sorts of of effects because of the body's chemistry i don't know something kind of similar i don't my, michael uh michael uh in the german, german yeah you, yeah. Uh, I, yeah i you, wanted to say something um about yeah recovery from war and going back because thomas mentioned celine's voyage au bout de la nuit and in that scene in Voyage to the bout de la nuit where he joins the army he does so i think if i remember correctly he's in a cafe he's had one or two too much to drink and he simply carried away with the enthusiasm of it all and the next thing he finds himself in the trenches realizing that he doesn't have anything particular against the Germans and in fact he's never met a German in his life and doesn't quite understand why he should be killing people who he's never met in his life but I think the more important element is that uh, all these wars are a kind of bad drug trip or um, you are literally drunk I mean the French soldiers in Poilu were given quantities of red wine to endure it. The Russians in the Second World War were filled with vodka before they were rushed over the top to be massacred by the Germans. 
German army itself was given uh, some kind of a drug, I forget which it is. So a lot of soldiers are either literally or indirectly drugged, either with alcohol or something else. And maybe this silence or this recovery has to be seen a little bit as a recovery from alcoholism, from an extremely bad LSD trip, sometimes literally a bad LSD, but the whole war experience seems to me, perhaps one should consider it more as um, a, a moment of insane intoxication from which you have to be detoxicated. Mm -hmm. um, and in fact, with the First World War, I think a lot of people would relate their experience to having been intoxicated. So I was completely out of my mind. Why did I want to go off and, and kill Germans or kill French people I've never met in my life? And what, what the heck was I doing here? But that, um, so that was just my sort of contribution yeah. that, that this there should be an idea that you've been in a, a state of, you've been intoxicated and you require a period of detoxication. Well, in defense of, of, of her book, let me just say that, that, that the, we only read the excerpts that I chose to read, uh, but I encourage you to read the entire book because she deals with exactly what we've been talking about. And that is the after effects. What happened afterwards when, when these folks came home? And the reason I left the picture into the text mm -hmm. was to, to give us an idea of what it is that, that they were dealing with that they had never dealt with before, which is not true. Because why? Hand-to-hand -hand combat with swords and, and mace and, you know, all these horrendous weapons one-on-one -on -one still paled in comparison to the damage that was done by the new weaponry. And with the approaching war that we are going to have with Russia, I, I think people have no idea of what it was coming in terms of yeah. what these weapons are going to do to people. And it was the same thing uh, after World War II, uh, as you were just speaking about uh, on the ships and stuff, that people really don't realize what these weapons do. Now, in the book, the author talks about this doctor, and I'm not quite sure how you pronounce his name with either the hard G or the soft G. It's either Giles or Giles, I'm not quite sure uh, the pronunciation of it. But he was the fellow who developed and and made incredible breakthroughs with prosthetics yeah uh, especially for facial wounds yeah was that was that in um in this country it rings a bell with a a unit in a hospital near near me I don't Mary's, know. There, uh, yeah. yeah in the sidcup yeah yeah right. I, i've uh -huh. been there yeah. yeah and she talks about that and about the 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 physical presence as we are now seeing in America uh, with, with catastrophically disabled people. Well, these people used to die in war. Well, now they live and they come home and they are physically just ravaged to the point where they are almost like the walking dead. Mm -hmm. And the, the author of this book goes into how this particular doctor did facial reconstruction, um, uh, um, boardwalk, I can't remember the name of the series now, uh, and one of the characters is uh, coming out of World War II, it takes place um, after World War I uh, in the Roaring Twenties, and he has a, a metal uh, it, it might be the Broadwalk Empire, maybe. Yes, yes, yeah, yeah, that, yeah. That's the. It's very good, extremely good. That particular character is really well, well uh, fleshed out. Could you put it in the chat? I, I'm sorry. I, I will. I will. I will. Yeah. Thank okay. you. Come on. Yeah. yeah. Um, and and she goes through. All the things, the the, the incredible uh, inventions and and ways that he helped people cope with with catastrophic injury, and I think in terms of what we're talking about as a debriefing and how and we do it for first responders, we do it for police officers who shoot people. They try to do it for soldiers when they come back. 
but there's something missing. And the reference to Vietnam, which was great, I'm, I'm so glad that we talked about Vietnam. One of the things that helps the men is remembrance, which this is what this book is about. The remembrance was actually to help them. And the fact that the English do it every year, I think, makes them perhaps a little more rational when it comes mm -hmm. to not your leaders. I'm talking about your people in general. Um, in terms of dealing with military things. When the Vietnam people came back and people spat on them, of course they were going to have worse problems than mm -hmm. the people mm -hmm. who were greeted as heroes. Mm -hmm. It's just mm -hmm. common sense. Mm -hmm. And and I would encourage you to go on and read this book and perhaps a fellow, uh, Cleveland, who wrote The Culture of War, that basically encourages all modern societies to start preparing the people emotionally for wars we hope we never have to fight. Mm -hmm. And he goes wow. in, into a lot of that. Um, it, it's a really good book. But I encourage you to read the rest of her book that covers a lot of these issues. All right, thanks. Uh, AJ, so are you, do, you, do you want to? Is, is, yes. Yeah. Very quick comment. While we're relating this idea to literature, I think uh, it bears mentioning that even though Tolkien was very, very much against allegory, most people uh, equate the suffering of the main character of The Lord of the Rings, uh, Frodo Baggins, uh, after the whole big adventure is over to Tolkien's own PTSD coming home from World War I. Mm -hmm. you know? Never had that. Uh, yeah, that mm -hmm. they, it's a wound that can never heal, even though they won, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, they uh, He never recovered from this, right? Um, so if you really read you know, uh, and pay attention to what's going on in the Lord of the Rings, a lot of it has to do with Tolkien's personal trauma having fought in World War I. Mm -hmm. you know, a lot of the horrific descriptions of warfare, you know, many people would relate uh, very, very directly. It isn't allegory. He wasn't really writing about World War I, but he, ex he expressed the trauma that he experienced in the text of the Lord of the Rings, especially not only during the combat and the fields of dead people and, and uh, stuff like that, but also the way the main character feels after the so-called you catastrophe where the world is saved, he still can't get it together. He can't live. He can't, uh, he, he constantly feels the pain and the trauma. So that's just something that not everybody picks up on because it reads it is a fantasy story. Um, mm -hmm. Nevertheless, it really has a lot to do, right, with uh, Tolkien's personal experiences in World War One. At least that's the way I've read a lot of people interpret this, and I, mm -hmm. I in my own reading, I agree. You know. Yeah. Yes, I'm sure. I'm sure. I'm sure it's very true. I'm sure it's very true. Um. Well, I, I, I think, uh, you know, we, we, we're coming uh, towards half past four. Maybe that's a, a reasonable time to um, bring this meeting to an end. If everyone said something uh, significant to, to, to the theme. And I, I think it's proved how fruitful reading from yes. um, uh, skilled historians can, can be. And uh, uh, a good illustration of the fact that, that the writing of history is is both, in some sense, a science that's bounded by rules of truthfulness and also an art which gives space to uh, have an inspired view of the facts. Um, uh, Michael, should we, should we 
Should we? Yeah, that's a fair point. Perhaps um, yeah. are we going to hear perhaps something for for next month on? Uh, yes, hoping, uh, hoping that uh, Janine's predicted war will not have taken. Yeah, I just gonna, yeah, I was going to say, um, ma maybe... if people are watching this uh, uh, a couple of years from now and uh, everything's yeah. hunky dory with with yes. the Russians, they they yeah. then they yeah. can uh, yeah smile. Uh, uh, well, the way things are going, it is fairly dark, but uh, uh, hope hope lives it up. Oh, I do. I mean, I yeah, I'm yeah. the last person to to make any any predictions here. What what would I? Well, I'm not going to make um, any predictions, but um, yeah. may may maybe uh, we should uh, take the name that that was thrown up and endorsed by by um, uh, s s several of us. Um, to read a piece by um, Asimov. Mr. Asimov. Yeah, that's uh, right. I, absolutely. That that's seems right. a good idea. The same thing, yeah. Um, yes. And especially if if one of his uh, pieces bears somewhat on the the, the, the rising uh, matter of, of, of AI, you know, so maybe something from the robot series. Um, if, if you if you want me to do it. Um, yeah, sure. I mean, if yeah, absolutely. Yes. Uh, that, that's... Well, we got two candidates, haven't we? Because AJ as well might like to. I don't but know. I think I think Hewitt's not su not suggested any books so far, unless well, I'm I wrong. Would suggest one. I think. Yeah, I mean, no, I I I think I, I uh, AJ suggested we read. Oh, I think it was. It was it. No, was it the, um, I, the robot I, one? Yeah. yeah, no, it was it was another book in the uh, uh, another meeting in the past. Whereas I don't think Hewitt has actually suggested. So let let let's let let's do Asimov and Hewitt. Yeah, you, I mean you can select the text. What, um, I, what I suggest the pivotal book I think of the ultimately of both sequences is the Robots of Dawn. AJ, would do you, do you concur with that? Uh, the Robots of Dawn, there were so many, I don't remember which one that was. Mm. It was that one, the one that unifies it with the foundation? Is that what you're talking about? Uh, it It's the prelude to the one that makes the link, which is Robots and Empire. Oh, but, yeah. But it, but it is <laughs> the one in which Elijah Bailey yes. takes the most crucial part. Um, yeah. The later versions of the foundation in the foundation's edge and uh, foundation earth make the link between all of that and the foundation series. Yeah, no, I just looked it up. I, it's just it's hazy. I read these a long, long time ago, but yeah, mm -hmm. it, I think that would be a good one. Good. Well, uh, I suppose that it's still in. Copyright, so it may not be easy to get a get a get a text that might involve oh. some some scanning. I don't know. Um, did you have a scanner, Hewitt? Yes, I do. Oh, good. So I mean, yeah, I mean, normally about twenty or so pages, twenty five, something like that, is. Uh, uh, a lot, isn't it? Well, it depends on the size of the page. Which yeah, I think I think I mean that's them. something like that. I don't know. Yeah, or or what if there's a if there's if it's if it's a, a, a passage that's got a, uh, a a definite ending that that's less obviously then then, then that would be fine. We, we we can talk about that. Mm -hmm. Um. All oh, right, then that that's 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 good. Maybe sometime towards the end of uh, of April. Well, as you all hear, if people have got a few minutes, could we settle on a time that might much easier than shooting emails around on the? Yeah, I, I'm I'm quite easy, so I think it'd be over to Hewitt to say what what day would suit him in April. Twenty first, mm -hmm. maybe, but I mean, I'm 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 personally easy. Uh, yes, I think the twenty first would be all right. Okay, that's good. All right, twenty first, same time. Yeah, half past two. That's uh, is that um, that's good. All right then. Is that the same time as 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 today? Happen? I would say the same time. Yeah, let's keep people it. People because... say if if everybody says no, no, it's a terrible time. Of course, we can change. But, um, I have to apologize for running out. There was a swan outside. It was the first one I've seen since I've been here. And a I had swan? To, yeah, and I had oh. to some bread. And then, of course, I locked myself out, and it's pouring rain. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Anyway. But where, where, where do you see the swan? Where are you? 
In the, I'm in Amsterdam. In the, oh, in a canal. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Oh, oh, nice. Oh, that's good. That's good. Oh, that's nice. Well, you, you should have, you should have grabbed it and brought it on. Brought it on. It would have been a nice. <laughs> I could have asked its opinion of, of, of things. Yeah, uh, nothing like a swan. Uh, yeah, quite quite dangerous animals. I think, but you know, very beautiful. But Janine, I, I thank you for today. That I, that was really an interesting. Yes, so thank you very much. Yeah. Yes, yeah. a very beautiful, very beautiful message. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Hugh, did you want a last word or something? Uh, if people are interested, and um, it's entirely up to yourselves, um, I, I've, I've written a, a fairly uh, rigorous analysis of the, both the Foundation and the robot novels in a paper on Asimov. Oh, well, if, if that's in file form, we can attach it to the invitation for yes, people to read absolutely. it if they want. Yeah. Be... Yeah. Right. So send it to me, Hewitt, and then I'm in the first invitation when I got your yeah. title and so on. I'll send mm. it out with that. Okie doke. Fine. Okay. Actually, you know what? I just got a copy of the Robots of Dawn Electronic. If you want, I can uh, paste it. Fine. Oh, really? Excellent. Yes. Excellent. Yeah, I don't know if it's copyrighted or not, but I have it. Oh, oh well, I, I, you know, if we're using it, uh, we're not making money of it out of it. So I think that's fine. It's not, uh, yeah. Okay, I can give you rich text format or PDF. PDF, uh, I think, is better. PDF, mm. please. Give me a moment. I can convert this to PDF momentarily. Give me just one minute. I just put it in a little magic converter thing here, and once I do that. Thank you, Tomas, for for um, sending the link for um, Boardwalk Empire. I appreciate that. Okay. 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 Here it is. Uh, it's being uploaded now. It's two megabytes. I put it in the chat. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. So see if that works. Okay. Yeah, it works with me. Yeah, I mean, I have thank you. Yeah, we're in here, but I don't have a scanner, so. No, that's good. I mean, I think it would be good if we could just do a file because that would uh, that's good to look at, and it also uh, um, uh, obviates the necessity of any of any scanning, and so it would be quite. Yeah, good, I think so. this will do. Maybe. Okay. All right then. Great. Um, I see everyone. Um, on the 21st oh, it's not it's not before it's not before yeah. it's not before okay, okay. thanks okay. very much bye, for everyone everybody. yeah enjoy the rest of your sunday and uh yeah bye-bye thanks bye. thanks janine for your, your choice bye-bye thank you bye